to the tour of 22.6. In this video, I'm going to talk about the data structure data map as part of Harlow 3.3. In the previous two videos, I've talked about the previous two data structures available within Harlow, arrays and data sets. This video closes out the set by discussing the last data structure, data map. When we talk about arrays and data sets, we talk about the rules each apply to themselves. That is, when we talk about arrays, we can have repeating values, but when we talk about data sets, we cannot. What if we sort of combine those together, though? What if we had a set of things, a data set, if you will, that then applied to arrays where multiple and repeating values were possible? Well, in that kind of theoretical scenario I've just proposed, we have something called a data map. That is, we map one set of values to another set of values, and we create a mapping of them, a data map. When we discuss a data map, it's helpful to keep in mind the previous rules we've established for the other data structures. That is, when we have a data set, it has to be unique. All the values within that set have to be unique, and when we attempt to add one that already exists, nothing will be done. In the case of data maps, we call the mapping of one value to another the use of names and values. So when we establish names and values, the name part of the pair has to be unique, sort of like we saw with the previous uses of data set. The value part is fairly close to what we had with arrays, which is to say we can have repeating values or any other value we want. When we establish a data map, we establish this pair. One thing, the name, connected to, mapped to something else. So when we create data maps within Harlow, we use one of two different macros available to us, very similar to what we saw with arrays and with data sets. For data map, we either use DM or data map right here, as I've used. In this case, notice we are mapping one value to another. Notice they go in pairs, and every time we create a data map, we do it using pairs. In this case, I am mapping one value, health, to another value, 10. So notice, like we saw with arrays and we saw with data sets, when we create data structures within Harlow, we need to do something with them. The do something with them part is usually the value of some variable. Remember, we can think of variables as buckets. So in this case, we're creating a data map and putting it in the bucket of, in this particular example, a temporary variable. So we create data maps using either DM or data map macros. And we map pairs one to another. Well, what if we want to work with something within that pair? Well, we can access things within the pair following the English possessive S that we've seen as previously working with arrays and working with data sets. In this case, though, when we want to access the name to get to the paired value part, we use it in quotation marks. Now, I will say here that technically in Harlow, we don't have to use quotation marks, but I'm going to recommend you always do so just to avoid an issue I'm going to show here in just a moment. So, in this case right here, we have two pairs, health mapped to 10, magic mapped to 10. So the name health to the value 10, the name magic to the value 10. Then we want to know what is the value associated with the name health, and then notice it's in quotation marks right here. So the English possessive S, the single quotation mark S, following the name of the variable, and then we can access this. So for example two, let's go ahead and jump over and start the story from there. And of course we will see 10. Notice we access it using the kind of possessive S in English. For example, data maps health. Now I mentioned the use of quotation marks, so let's circle back to that before I move to the next example. So I highly recommend people use quotation marks around the name within the pair of the name value pair. And the reason for this is because technically this will work. So if I remove this right here and we replay this, it will work. The problem then becomes if I accidentally introduce a space right here and then I try to do the same right here. Notice it doesn't know what I'm talking about anymore and even the little highlighter is very confused. 
So again, I strongly recommend you use quotations because with quotations, we can do that and this now matches this. So you don't have to use quotations, but I strongly recommend you do just to prevent issues like that. And if we replay it even with the space, we get the exact same thing. So generally use quotations in all cases. So we can create a data map, a pairing of name to a value. We can access the value using the name. What if we want to do something else with it? Well, if we want to potentially change the value within that data map, all we need is the name. We use the name to get to the value. So in this case, we are creating a data map. And in this case, I'm using the set macro to change the value using that name. So set example data maps health to 15. And notice I'm continuing to use quotation marks. Again, good practice to get into. And then here I'm accessing it and then we're checking it. So if we move over to example three and I start the story from there, we will see the exact same thing. It's now 15 instead of 10 because I changed the value. Using again the name to get to the value. Name value pairs. So let's kind of move along this. We can create them, we can access them, again, using quotation marks, recommended pattern, and we can change them, access them, probably what we've been doing. Let's move over to example four. Example four points out some of the kind of pitfalls you can get into when thinking about data maps. Each different data structure I've covered across the last couple of videos, starting with arrays and then data sets, and then this video, data maps, each come with some pros and cons. They have some benefits, and then they have some potential pitfalls, potential problems we can run into. For data maps, it can be extremely useful to map some type of name to some type of value. As we saw with health, we could do it with magic, and we could do it with any number of other things we might want to track in an interactive story. What we need to be aware of, though, is that data maps have kind of reduced functionality as it comes to some of the other keywords we've seen with arrays and with data sets. When we worked with arrays, we could use the keyword length and immediately get the length, the number of things within the array. We can't do that technically with a data map. We can put things into a data map, but we cannot directly access the number of things within the data map. So here's where things get slightly more complicated when we work with data maps. They're incredibly useful, but again, everything comes with a little bit of pros and cons. The sort of con for this approach is that we can't directly access the length. However, we can kind of go around it and get it in a different way. So in this particular case, we're creating a data map that has a single entry, but again, we can't access the length directly. However, there are a number of macros that work with data maps that help us access various things. One of them is dm-names DM right here. dm-names gives us an array, produces an array of all of the names within the data map. Because all of the names within the data map will be unique, that if we have an array and it has all the names from the data map, then we have access to the number of things within that data map. Because all of the corresponding names will be unique. Again, thinking about data sets and those rules. So in this case, we're being a little bit tricky. We know there's only one entry within this data map, but potentially there could be many, many, many pairs. What we can do though, is we can get all of the names in an array, and because the keyword length works with arrays, we can get the current length of the data map in this way. So we can't get it directly, but we can get it sort of indirectly by creating the data map or having a data map we wanna use, creating an array of their names from that, knowing that they all will be unique, and then getting the length from that. So we can't get the length directly, but we can get it sort of indirectly using the DM hyphen names macro to produce an array knowing that the array data structure can work with the keyword length. This is where again knowledge of these various data structures starts to come into play. All of which have pros and cons. So let's move on to the next example. So potentially what if we wanted to get a random entry from a data map? Well as we saw with arrays we can use the keyword random to get a random entry from the array and that can be incredibly powerful. When it comes to data sets, we couldn't do it because we just didn't know the order and couldn't access the order of the entries within that data structure. When it comes to data maps, that's kind of the same problem. We can't access 
the random entries because we don't know their order. But what we can do is the trick I just showed working with the dm-names macro. That is, we go ahead and create a data map. Then we use DM names to get access to an array. And then because the keyword random works with arrays, we can get a random entry. And then because we know we can tie a name to a value with the data map, then we can use the name we got randomly from the array to then access the particular value and change it or do something with it, and then see if it's updated. So this is kind of a complicated example to get around the fact that we can't work with the keyword random directly with a data map, but we can with arrays. And again, kind of keeping in mind the pros and cons of each approach. We can use the keyword random with arrays, we can't use it directly with data maps, but we can convert a part of a data map into an array, use the keyword. So here's the code right here. We create a data map. We get all of the names, we get a random entry, we change the random entry plus 10, so either health or magic will get increased by 10. And then we go ahead and get the current values of health and magic. Notice continuing uses of the quotations. And then we can get health and magic. So let's go ahead and jump down to example five. I will go ahead and start. And we see this time we increased magic. And then that time we increased health, and then at any type of the time we did it, it would be a 50% chance of increasing either one of them. And potentially that could be very useful. Let's continue along here. So we can create data maps, we can access the names, or access the values using the names within data maps, and we can use those to either change the values or access the values. And as we've just seen, we can work with the keywords length and random as long as we keep in mind they don't work directly on data maps, but do work on the arrays we produce from them. There are two other things we want to think about. Let's move to example six. Example six works with the keyword contains. Now, the keyword contains is a little bit tricky as it comes to data maps. The keyword contains does not affect values, it only affects names, similar to what we saw with DM names. So this here, does this example data map contains health? It does. It contains health right here as a name. It doesn't contain health as a value. Keep in mind, names are matched to values. So we can check the names, but we can't check the values. Potentially, though, in most cases, we care more about the names than the values. We want to know, is health something? Is magic something else? But potentially, keep in mind, we can't access values directly. We can access the names using the contains. So let's hit one last thing for this video. We can create data maps. We can access their values using names. We can do anything with those values once we have the name. Potentially, we can use the keyword length and the keyword random keeping in mind we need to convert into arrays first. What if we want to add to a data map or potentially subtract from a data map? Well, things are a little more complicated. We can do one, we can't do the other. So let's look at this last example. Potentially, if I wanted to add a new entry to a data map, I can, keeping in mind that data maps, like arrays and like data sets, have its own special rule. We previously saw that only arrays can affect arrays. And then we also saw in a previous video that only data sets can affect data sets. Well, this also applies for data maps. Only data maps can affect data maps. So in order to add an entry to a data map, we have to create a data map. And so we see in this case, I create an initial data map. Again, pairs, this is one pair, this is a second pair. And then I want to add experience points. Notice the space and continuing to use the quotation marks. And I can do that. And then I can check to see, does this contain experience points? And we will see it does. So let's go ahead and move to this last passage. And we see it does. Now you may be asking yourself at this point, okay, well, we can add to, and we previously saw with arrays and with data sets that we can add to and remove from those other data structures. This is where data maps are different. We can't remove anything. Or that is, we can, but it's fairly complicated. Part of that is that the subtraction operation doesn't work with data maps. And the reason is, is because it has that kind of combined data setup. 
it, it is as if a data set and an array were kind of glued together. So we can't easily delete one thing without potentially messing everything up. So we can technically do subtraction, but it's much more complicated than what we covered in this video. On a kind of more basic level, addition works very well. We see it right here, subtraction doesn't. So I'm not covering it in this video, but it is possible, and in a future video, come back to this idea, talking about how it is possible to create a new data map based on an old data map by doing some other operations. But for at least right now, as we're introduced to the data structure, subtraction that is removing from isn't strictly possible, at least in the way that we have explained the other data structures. So let's review one more time data maps. Data maps are a way to map a name to a value. They are a data structure, so we can put multiple values in relation to each other. A data map, though, is a little like gluing a data set to an array. That is, all names have to be unique, but the values can repeat if they need to be. When we access the value, we always need to know the name, similar to how we need to know the position in an array to get to the value. When we work with the names to get to the values, we use quotation marks around the name, again, good practice to get into, just in case they can't end spaces or other special symbols that have other meanings to Harlow. We've also seen how we can potentially use the keyword length and the keyword random by keeping in mind that we can use other macros with data maps to convert parts of them into an arrays and do different things with them, potentially getting the length or getting a random entry and kind of expanding our code from there. We've also seen that data maps like arrays and like data sets can only be affected by the same thing. Arrays affect arrays, data sets affect data sets, data maps are only affected by other data maps. We can add those together, but when it comes to subtraction, it's a little more tricky, at least in the current version of Harlow 3.3. So we've covered data maps, and now, as we move into the next video, I will talk about ways of potentially approaching different data structures that we've covered in pre previous videos. Arrays, data sets, and data maps, and when each might be better than the other. Again, keeping in mind each of which has good benefits and also potential pitfalls at the same time. Thanks for watching.